This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome. You've heard and read the spin the media and the politicians have put on the issues of the day. To get the correct spin on what's going on in North Carolina, let's introduce you to our panel of experts. They include political consultant Brad Crone, John Hood from the John Locke Foundation, NC Policy Watch's Chris Fitzsimon, and political analyst Chris Sinclair. We've got an interesting show for you this week, including how sequestration affects North Carolina, the rearrangement of boards and commissions in our state, a proposal to make it easier to open single, single specialty surgery centers, and whether the NC Railroad should pay the state dividends. Should be good conversation if I can get single specialty surgery centers out. Let's get started. It didn't come as a big surprise the Congress and the President were unable to reach a compromise agreement on the budget, triggering automatic budget cuts known as sequestration. When the automatic spending cuts were passed in 2011, nobody thought they would ever uh, come into being. But here we are. Federal spending accounts for 4.5% of North Carolina's $420 billion gross state product. So the economic impact to our state could be significant. In fact, one economist has said it could cost as much as a billion and a half dollars. Question one to Brett. Half of these sequestration cuts come in defense spending. And of course, we've got big military presences in, in Fort Bragg and Fayetteville, Seymour Johnson in Goldsboro, Cherry Point at Havelock, Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, and the Coast Guard Air Base at Elizabeth City. What can we expect to see as a result of, of these sequestration cuts? I think there'll be some interruption on the civilian side, especially with furloughs, with employees facing two weeks to four weeks of furloughs. Overall, you're looking at probably up to 7.5% of the entire federal uh, defense budget being cut. The f entire federal budget with sequestration is 3%. Now, Tom, most families across the state of North Carolina, across the country over the last three years have worked real hard to cut more than 3% of their family budget because they faced hard times. Middle America and working families have felt the pinch of this recession, the Great Recession. So all said and done, it's a starting point. We've got to have a national debate. As Democrats and Republicans, we've got to start talking to each other and stop the yelling at each other. The president needs to stop moving the fence post every time he gets into a negotiation, and the Republicans need to lay on the table that, yes, we've got to have some revenue to get ourselves out of this hole. I'd like to hear some conversation about this. There are a growing number of voices who are saying, you know what, all of this ballyhoo, all of this creaming wolf, all of this uh, doomsday uh, forecast of what's going to happen with sequestration, it, it just ain't going to happen. It's just not going to make that much difference. John, the stock market certainly has not <clears throat> reflected this? No, well, the stock market's being inflated by the Federal Reserve, but the, 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 the idea that there was going to be some groundswell of furor and fear about sequestration was always unrealistic. People assume because the fiscal cliff was so interesting that people want to have an interesting fiscal conversation every two months. And the truth is, fiscal cliff kind of sounds interesting. It's sort of like Wile E. Coyote's chasing the road runner and he's flying off a cliff and it's the end of the year and it affects your taxes you're about to file. Sequestration? I mean, it kind of sounds like the jury and you're going to make the president and Congress, you know, going to sequester them at Camp David for three months, which people would really like, by the way. So I think that there was a boy that cries wolf problem. In fact, there was an episode that happened uh, around the sequestration deadline uh, where there was an, uh, somebody in Raleigh, this was a, got a national story out of this, somebody in Raleigh who's working in the ag area was trying to email back and forth with his superior saying, now, you know, we know, I know we said we couldn't do all these things. Couldn't we move some money around so that we don't have to stop doing inspections? And he was told, I don't do anything that would contradict our claims of what would happen if sequestration happens. So there is a difficulty here of getting the public against an idea that most people, at least in theory, think is okay. Now, there are real practical problems with it. It's a poor way to cut spending, but in the absence of not cutting spending, it's hot, kind of hard Chris to argue. Chris Sinclair, uh, Agriculture Commissioner uh, Steve Troxler, told the legislature this week he's concerned about fel furloughs to federal meat inspectors, which could have a major effect in North Carolina so far as the pork and poultry in production industry in, is concerned. Uh, is this a big problem in our state? 
Well, I don't think anybody really knows yet if it's a big problem, but everybody, I, again, I agree with uh, Brad, what Brad said, and what you said about the, the president going around and crying wolf. Um, nobody's really buying into his, uh, I mean, he's playing politics at best, and he's being disingenuous at worst because here's a man who agreed to these cuts, helped put these cuts in place. Well, Bob and, Woodward said it was and, his and, idea. And, <laughs> and then turn around and beat everybody up over the, uh, over the head with it. And guess what? Nobody's really paying attention because, to it. Wait, 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 wait a second. You know who else told us this was going to be horrible? John McCain and Lindsey Graham. Yeah. They went on a tour around right. the country and said this is going to be one of the worst things that's ever that's going to exactly happen in right. Carolina. That's exactly right. Last year. So this is not just Barack Obama saying these are going to be right. really bad right. cuts. Republicans have said it. Paul Ryan said it when it was uh, yeah. put in place in 2011. So look, this is not one party saying these are bad. These are both parties saying this is bad. And it is only a, hand, a couple. But is of, wait a minute. Wait a second. It's only a two or three percent of the entire federal budget. But Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. Public, public assistance programs are not part of that. So it's Medicare, actually well, Medicare, Medicare, Medicare actually is. Medicare actually is. But it's 8 percent of the federal defense budget. It's, a, it's 7 or 8 percent of a lot of other programs. I mean, people are going to lose income. But, They're going to lose some of their jobs. And if it's, if it's not so bad, then why did John Boehner and Paul Ryan and John McCain say it was going to well, be so bad? Well, it amounts bad? to $4 uh, out of every, every, one, every average family's so daily Boehner budget. And, Boehner and McCain and Lindsey Graham were telling, were telling they, lies they were last year. They right. were complaining about the effects on the defense budget. I think that's a legitimate concern. What I would tell them as I agree with you, but in the absence of doing nothing, yeah. figure out a way to cut six right. well, trillion well, dollars. Well, well, that's final, 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 the budget. final, that's quick, the final question on this. We got a March 27th deadline again, another deadline, March 27th, so far as as the defense budget and so forth is concerned. What's going to happen there? Well, this is, has to do with the government shutting down without a continuing resolution. Right. Essentially, a quasi budget plan being put into place, and they'll do it. They'll put something in place. Yeah, no, you'll have a you, you'll have a CR. Uh, continuing resolution. The big question is going to be, uh, what are you going to do on the debt ceiling? Hmm. Well, don't forget you can watch NC Spin whenever you want by visiting our website, ncspin.com, or you can visit NC Spin on YouTube, or you can visit NC Spin on Facebook. And while you're there, read our panelists' perspectives, our weekly column, and join in the conversation. Remember, that's ncspin.com, NC Spin on Facebook, or NC Spin on YouTube. Join in. When we come back after these messages, we're going to talk about the boards, not basketball boards. NC Spin will return after these messages. Before NC lawmakers tackle immigration reform, they need to understand it's a billion-dollar issue. State legislatures in Georgia and Alabama have passed stringent laws that have decimated their agribusiness economy, leaving crops in the field to die and costing their farmers millions of dollars in lost revenue. Before we hurt our farmers, let's think about a responsible immigration policy that works. Prosperous farms create good jobs right here at home. Paid for by NC Farm Bureau. Tired of stop-and-go traffic? Travel by train. It's convenient, safe, and affordable. Visit ByTrain.org for more information. Betty Ray McCain is one of North Carolina's most colorful and enjoyable persons. From her small-town upbringing to her eight years as Secretary of Cultural Resources, Betty has hundreds of stories about people, places, and events. You are invited to attend a special Carolina Collection event, an evening with Betty Ray McCain at the North Carolina Museum of History on Tuesday, March 12th at 5.30 p.m. The evening includes a reception with heavy hors d'oeuvres, followed by an hour-long interview with Betty Ray McCain in the NC Museum of History Auditorium. Tickets are $25 and group rates are available. Seating is limited, so make your reservations now. Visit ncspin.com or call 919-832-1416. The presenting sponsor for this Carolina Collection event is Touchstone Energy, and the reception sponsor is the North Carolina Democratic Party. Register now at ncspend.com or 919-832-1416. We now return to NC Spin. There's an old saying that a new broom sweeps clean, but our legislators have swept out the appointees to most of all our boards and commissions in the state. The Senate version of, of the bill would fire all members of the Utilities Commission, Industrial Commission, Coastal Resources Commission, Lottery Commission, and Wildlife Resources Commission, among a host of others. It would share more appointed power with the governor and reduce the size of some of these boards. 
The House version allowed some of the current members to remain so the boards would have some experienced members. But the version passed by the House angered Senator Tim Apodaca, the sponsor of the original bill, who said he couldn't wait till it came to conference committee to be resolved. Question one to Chris Fitzsimon. Democrats claim this is a power grab orchestrated by Republicans to put their political friends on these boards. But Republicans counter by saying, hey, these appointees were political appointments to start off with. What's the impact going to be to the average North Carolinian? Well, I mean, people are going to make important decisions about how much your electricity bill will be next year. These will be made by appointments, all made, in effect, maybe all but one, by the governor, who, by the way, worked for Duke Power for 28 years. Uh, a lot of these boards and commissions, the, the, what this says to me is, is, is this. When you say, you're, when you're appointed to a board or commission in North Carolina right now, what they tell you your term is is completely irrelevant. <laughs> your term is whatever the General Assembly decides your term is. That's the precedent that we're setting. Sort of uh, serving at the pleasure. Well, absolutely. And I think, and you know, there, there have been modest uh, things. There have been some of these things that have happened in individual cases before, but we've never seen this kind of sweeping change. Uh, and I think it's a, I think it's a disservice to the people uh, who are on these boards who are working hard. I think it's a, uh, it's an unfortunate way to do business. And if you'll notice, this we didn't have a lot of testimony. There are a lot of new legislators in the building. They don't know what the industrial commission does. They're just voting with the party leadership to wipe out all these appointments. And and the final point about this, the most disturbing part of the debate to me was individual legis legislators in the House before they supported this complaining about an individual commissioner's rulings on a commission, as if they should then step in and remove a governor's appointment because they don't like a ruling that somebody made on an industrial commission, a workers' compensation case. You're talking about micromanaging uh, part of state government. I think, it's a, I think it's a terrible precedent. If I was appointed or anybody's appointed to a board, don't believe them when they say it's eight or four, even four years. It's raw politics. I mean, that's just all it is. And here's the problem the Republican legislatures going to have. They're going to outrun the headlights. And they're going too far. Uh, and play in politics when the average North Carolinian really doesn't care about who serves on the Industrial Commission or the Utilities Commission, even though they do have broad powers that impact their lives on a daily basis. They're worried about the unemployment rate. They're worried about the stability of their local economy. And this isn't helping that process. And that's where the Republicans are going to get in trouble. They're going to go too far. They're going to overstep, and they're going to pay for it in the next election cycle. All right, well, let's talk about the Senate version versus the House version. The House tried to address some of the concerns that had been raised, particularly so far as uh, eliminating some of these commissioners and institutional memory that had been on some of these boards. Judges. I think that what the Senate did was, was sweeping. Some, some people would argue a meat cleaver um, approach. The uh, House took a scalpel approach to, um, the, to replacing some of the members, and I think a very pragmatic approach under the leadership of Representative Tom Murray. He got the bill and he said, wait a minute, we cannot eliminate these Superior Court judges. We have constitutional issues. So we have to keep those folks in there. They also said there are some members, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, who have institutional knowledge, who will be beneficial to us, and so they staggered some of those folks, kept them on, and then they moved other people out. So I think the House's approach is very pragmatic, it's very thoughtful, and I, I think what we'll end up with is a good bill. But anybody that believes... Well, wait a minute. Apodaca says, I can't wait well, to get this thing in well, conference. And, and, and it sounds to me like he's not ready to yield. Well, I think that most people would argue that, particularly with the judges, that you run up against some real issues constitutionally, and you have to be very careful. But I think you'll end up with a very pragmatic uh, bill. And to your point, Chris, um, and to your point, it is raw politics. And the reason you haven't seen these sweeping uh, changes is because Democrats have been in charge for the last... Uh, several decades. John, so we wouldn't see didn't, didn't happen with Jim Martin. Didn't. He didn't have a legislature. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> but uh, well, we've talked about this a little bit before. And I, I, one of the hidden aspects of this bill I don't think has gotten properly reported is that in addition to being a power grab so far as Republicans replacing the members, <laughs> it's also a power grab so far as the governor is concerned. Because now all of a sudden the governor's splitting some of these appointments that heretofore he had the appointed power altogether to, to make. Yeah, that is a very important point. It, clearly, there are partisan issues involved, but there's also a uh, legislative branch trying to gain some power against the executive branch that's going on here. Uh, and, as you alluded to, some of the boards are simply being made smaller, and in some cases, they might even get rid of some of the less important And some boards. of it is legitimate. And I, mean, I would we don't say need all seven of those things sound reasonable to me. And... Uh, going towards a system where most of these terms are four years and line up with gubernatorial terms makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, you can do it wisely or you can do it rashly, but it seems to me the goal is not a bad one from the, from the purpose of good government. Brad, one of the things that I, I find interesting, particularly as it relates to the State Utilities Commission, 
it is just no secret to anybody at all in North Carolina that if you're going to get appointed to the State Utilities Commission, it will only be because the utility companies bless your appointment. Do, well, does do either one of these bills do anything to, to remove some of the power? or No, not necessarily, but everybody knows that the Utilities Commission has been the great place for people who are in the great club of politics go to find the cushion. And that it's a. Now let's be careful here because my dad served on that. It, it's a great <laughs> perk. I mean, it, it is. is a great it's a perk. It's a good job. It's a very good job. Very well paid. High status, and um, you know that's just been the political reality. The one thing I will say with the raw politics: to the victor goes the spoils. No doubt about that. You know, Democrats have played those politics for a hundred years, so it doesn't surprise me. What I'm saying is that the rashness of it, the severity of it may come back and but it's only Chris, you raised, you raised a point time. I think that needs to be underscored and, and and that is that your concern is business will all of a sudden become too prominent uh, on, on, uh, an interest on all these boards. Well, and, they, and the Senate version especially removes a lot of the conflict of interest language on some of these boards, so I'll agree that the House put some of that back when at least we can try to do that. Two quick things about that. One is it was interesting in the House that there was a, an amendment to reduce the salary of the utilities commissioners from 120 right. something thousand to 80,000. The Republicans tabled it, wouldn't even let a vote on the amendment, wouldn't have let us have, a, wouldn't let the Democrats have a vote on the amendment. The second thing is the governor is directly affected and has yet to say anything about it, other than it didn't come from his office. Right. I think we deserve and need to know what is Governor McCrory think of this bill? Is, does he think it's the House is a good idea? The Senate plan should be slowed well, down. And Final think, word, Chris. Well, I think that we, all roads lead back to Representative Tom Martin. He's a lawyer. He's a smart uh, legislator, and he said we cannot have these uh, rash approach. This rash approach, and at the end of the day. To your point about ethics, he said we have to make sure that we have these conflicts of interest things worked out and, and we put them back in the It'll be interesting to see what the conference committee does on that. When we come back after these messages, we talk about certificate of need. NC Spin will return after these messages. Not all high school graduates go to college. Not all employers need college graduates. Are North Carolina's public schools preparing graduates with the skills employers need now? Join the discussion. Visit nceducate.com. This is Robert. Hey, yeah, still going. Well, I talked to them and they gave me some options. Yeah, it does. I think it's going to work. We now return to NC Spin. In the 1970s, the federal government mandated that most all medical service providers, including hospitals, doctors, offices, long-term care facilities, and others, obtain a certificate of need to operate. In the 1980s, the feds removed that requirement, and many states eliminated their certificate of need laws. But North Carolina actually tightened requirements and is one of the most restrictive states in the country. A new bill being proposed by the legislature would allow single specialty ambulatory surgery centers to be approved. It would increase competition, patient access, reduce cost, and improve efficiency for surgeons, so the bill says. Kathy Wright with the North Carolina Orthopedic Association says hospitals in North Carolina have had many years of very limited competition from the few existing ambulatory surgery centers and diagnostic centers, and it's time for us to allow competition. Question one to John. We've talked before about certificate of need or CON programs in North Carolina. What do you think about this proposal to, re to allow ambulatory surgery centers in the outside hospitals? I think it would be a dose of medicine good for what ails us, which is rising health care costs and inadequate competition and choice for patients. When certificate of need types of policies were first imposed by the federal government and then, and then retained by some states, such as North Carolina, years ago, the theory was that health care operates like nothing else. And we all know that competition is good in most fields, but it isn't good in health care because it will create additional sort of semi-vacant buildings or wings or machines, and the uh, people who own them will just prescribe more services and use the machines more in order to fill up the, the, the docket, and that'll raise costs. Now, this is an interesting theory. It has already really been tested empirically now for decades. There's no good evidence that it saves money. There's actually fairly compelling evidence that regulating things 
as tightly as North Carolina does increases costs because of a lack of competition. So I say let's get started. Chris, a, a lot of the reason why we've kept these CON needs is because you know, the hospitals across the state have, have been uh, just adamant about uh, removing CON to, to increase competition. Uh, they are opposing this bill because they say it allows surgeons to cherry pick procedures right. that the hospitals need in order to remain profitable. Well, is that I, a valid argument? I, well, I think it is a valid argument. We're going to have a we have a real struggle in North Carolina. It's going to be exacerbated by the decision not to expand Medicaid. The, the rural hospitals in North Carolina are losing something called their disproportionate share money, which is money they get to take care of indigent patients in their hospitals. It's not going to be as big a deal in the larger hospitals and urban areas, but rural hospitals who are already struggling, uh, the nonprofit hospitals are going to be hit now twice. Uh, and the last thing they need is the, the, the stuff that they do and do well to have those cherry picked by somebody to, that moves across the street or across town and then they're left with even more folks that can't pay and, and just providing those services. There's a lot of issues why this isn't a good idea, but I think the fundamental one is our rural hospitals, many of them are teetering already, and I don't think we want to leave, leave somebody 150 miles without a hospital. Well, Chris so, Sinclair, the other that, side of this, go ahead. Well, I think as a society, the reason we have certificate of need is to make sure that our health care delivery system has an infrastructure that is secure financially. What happens in Roanoke Rapids when that hospital is threatened? What happens in, in uh, Scotland County down in Laurenburg when that hospital's in trouble? So as a society, as a state, we have a duty to make sure that we have an infrastructure in place, and that's what Certificate of Need has done. Well, that's, you, that's what it's supposed to have done. Now, do you guys really think that the big business for these ambulatory surgical centers are in Scotland County and Roanoke Rapids. That, that's not where the bulk of the activity will be. It will be, it will be these, these uh, doctors and companies going into Wake, Mecklenburg, Forsyth, Guilford. It will increase competition in urban areas and probably not have much effect in rural Well, areas. Chris Sinclair, one of the things that the bill sponsors are saying is that we removed the uh, upper G, the GI procedures uh, several years ago from having to be done in a hospital and allowed it to be done in uh, out, outsource, outpatient type procedures and it's resulted in two hundred million dollars worth of savings to the patients in our state. Yeah, but if you look at the leading gastroenterologists, at least in, in our area, in, the, in Wake County, they're, being, they're going back into the hospital structure. They're going back, the in, hospitals are back in. But they're also seeing the benefit of that. And, and I agree with uh, Chris and Brad in terms of uh, looking the, the, the hospitals serve a need. They have served a need. I don't think there's a lot of empirical evidence that shows that these one-off companies that will come in and set up these uh, ambulatory centers, are, uh, they're driven by profit, pure profit. They're driven by Good. their shareholders. Well, and, 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 so and but is there any incentive well, for them to drive down costs? Aren't these doctors making huge what? amounts of money and hospital administrators? But you think these guys are they're also serving a lot for of a folks that they can't afford? And are these ambulatory centers that are going to come in? Are they going to serve these people they, that they can't afford? They're going to down the for hospital. a particular service. The hospitals are going to lose the business. The hospitals end up going broke. It's the oldest oh, story come on, in the Brad, book. When was the last time you heard of a hospital going broke? You look at Roanoke Rapids. You look at Scotland County. You look out in the western part of the state. Your rural hospitals. I'll give you this. Under attack. What if you had? What if you changed the bill and you said you can only do it in the urban areas? Would the hospital association change their opinion? No, they don't care about what you're arguing for. They want no competition at all. Period. It doesn't matter whether it's in. Fields, they don't they matter whether it's in a, a heavily populated area or in a sparsely populated area. They simply want to retain their monopoly privilege. All right, we're going to change this conversation and start working on the railroad after these messages. <laughs> NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. Be sure to reserve your seat for an evening with Betty Ray McCain. Tuesday, March 12th at the NC Museum of History. Tickets are $25 and can be purchased at ncspin.com or 919-832-1416. In 1848, North Carolina passed legislation to create an east-west railroad as an economic development tool. In 1854, Railroad President John Motley Moorhead asked lawmakers for more money, calling the railroad a tree of life for our state. Well, today the North Carolina Railroad consists of 317 miles of tracks between Charlotte and Moorhead City, and for many years the state owned 75 percent with shareholders owning 25 percent. In 1998, the state bought out the private shareholders, but a 2012 legislative report says the railroad has benefited from that new arrangement. The state hasn't profited much from it. 
and a bill recently filed calls for the railroad to sell some of its vast holdings and pay the state dividends. Specifically, Chris Sinclair, they want the, the railroad to give the state $15 million and 25% of the profits from this point forward. What do you think of this bill? It's a good idea. I mean, look, the single shareholder for, this comp for the North Carolina Railroad is a North Carolina taxpayer. So at the end of the day, we have to make sure the taxpayer is made whole, and this is a good idea. And But uh, Brad, this railroad doesn't generate but $16 million worth of revenue to start off with and only has $9 million. Yeah, We're not you, talking any money. Right, you're not, but you look at their asset sheet, and man, I'll tell you what, they're sitting on some valuable property. No question. And uh, the, I, I would agree with Chris that, that the taxpayers need to made, be made whole on it. So is it, is it going to pass? Uh, I think there's Half at a least minute. a chance. I, I'd like to privatize the railroad entirely. Perhaps we could use the proceeds to subsidize rural hospitals or some high quality. <laughs> <laughs> you need a certificate of need for that. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Give your feedback and read our column. Visit our website, ncspin.com. Catch NC Spin on Facebook or NC Spin on YouTube. And we hope you'll join us next week when we'll take on more issues of interest to the people of North Carolina. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Join us next week and get the spin on issues facing our state.